Hello, and welcome to Insurance Agents Talk Shop. I'm your host, Doug Coombs, Chief Marketing Officer at SIAA. Today's episode is Maintaining Carrier Connections. I'd like to introduce my guest, Jeff Baer, Head of IA Marketing and National Accounts at Foremost Insurance. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Doug. Thank you very much for having me on your podcast. I'm privileged to be asked and um, look forward to having an interaction with your audience today. So thanks very much. Thank you for joining us. It's uh, it's awesome to have you here. So I'm going to set the stage a little bit. Um, the the relationships that agents forge with carriers are not just about policies, premiums, or underwriting, uh, but to the heart of the matter, it's about the underlying trust and mutual respect. I believe, and the, a strong agent carrier relationship facilitates smoother transactions, clearer communication, and enhanced opportunities for both. Uh, especially at times like now, uh, and considering the hard market that we're all slogging through. So. In this episode of Insurance Agents Talk Shop, we're going to delve into this critical relationship and explore how agents can nurture these invaluable connections to weather any storm or make things even better when the market is doing well. So we'll start off with the first question to you, Jeff, and that is from your perspective, what are the primary challenges agents face during a hard market? Well, thank you for that question, Doug. And it's interesting. I was with a group of agents uh, over the last uh, two days, about 20 of them. And we had this conversation several times about about the hard market. And I think if I'm being elegant in the answer in a way, the construct is really pretty simple. It, It is retaining customers. And as part of that retention effort, it's the actions that you as an agent have to do to retain those customers and the output of that, which is really explaining premium increases. So exploring that first one for a moment, retaining customers, it's that discussion around what do you do about deductibles? What do you do about coverage limits? How do you explain what the change in premiums is relative to what the marketplace is doing and what you're seeing, what other carriers are doing? That's sort of everyone else is doing it. Might work very well with long-term customers, but with shorter-term customers, um, we're seeing increased shopping in the marketplace and you're seeing people moving and jumping around the basis of premium changes. So kind of coming back to that premium change, a lot of discussion from the agents I was with around that piece about how to help insureds understand that this isn't uh, a profit motive on the part of the independent agent or a profit motive on the part of the company. It is really an attempt uh, this year, more than any other, I've, I've been doing this for over 40 years, to ensure that we have the right pricing in place given the constraints at the insurance department level and in many cases, or, or even uh, constraints in terms of our ability to um, get the right content into the insurance departments in, in the manner in which it's anticipated, to explain to insureds the cost elements, the individual cost elements have increased so exponentially high that the amount that they're paying extra it isn't even relative to the expansion of risk that we've seen. A customer who has a $50,000 kitchen has a fire a few years ago, that's a $100,000 kitchen a day. A customer that had a vehicle that would be in the shop for a couple of days now has to wait a couple of months to get their vehicle in the shop. So that continuing continuing aspect of labor shortages, along with shortages in uh, supplies and in that chain, continues to be very pervasive and challenging. And it is, fortunately for us anyway, because we work with primarily independent agents, up to the expertise of our independent agent constituency to explain those premium differentials and work to retain their customer base. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. No, that actually is good. And, and I'm, as I'm listening to you and, and hearing you talk about, you know, understand, they need to help the uh, the end client understand. It really comes down to communications uh, in many ways, but not just between the carrier and the agent, but th- that needs to carry through nicely to obviously the the client, the insured. Um, but but as you were talking, I thought, you know, some of the things that, uh, that folks uh, or agents could deliver to their clients in terms of communication and understanding would be things like, remember, Remember that bumper you used to replace uh, a decade ago? Right. Well, when you replace that that bumper today, it's got a camera built into it. It's got multiple sensors built into it. Um, this, it's just it's a lot more itself than it was. Um, and so that's going to reflect, obviously, uh, a price increase across the board, right? So um, I, I do think that it's that kind of uh, at the ground level uh, communication and conveying an understanding to the client uh, that that will help, uh, I think, with especially with existing customers, obviously, uh, in a hard market. 
So Yeah, Doug, and quite frankly, it goes back to the old onboarding, offboarding conversation I think that many agents are aware of, right? A customer sold on the basis of price will leave you on that same basis. Yeah. So agents that do a fantastic job of being trusted advisors, explaining what the coverage elements are, ensuring that they align with what the customer's exposure is, are the ones that are able to navigate this time and this space very effectively. Yeah. And well put. Thank you for that. So, so let's um, let's take that then a little bit further down the path. And as we're talking about these challenges, and we understand that communication is a key component to kind of uh, meeting the challenges associated there. What about how this affects the relationship between agents and carriers? What are the what what are the issues there? That's a really, I'm sorry, I, I hate to say that's a really interesting question, but I, I, I think all of your questions here could be really interesting, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, uh, that dynamic is incredibly important because of something you said a moment ago, and, and it really is communication. Um, I do think there's a way, and maybe this is only my, my own personal um, position in this area, but there is a way when you have challenges or difficulties or, in fact, maybe conflicts with your carriers to come to the table clearly articulating what that challenge or problem or difficulty is, whether it's pricing, whether it's underwriting, and articulating potential solutions, and by the way, in a positive and solution-oriented manner. That ability to keep that communication line open is, is incredibly important. I think about um, our agency advisory council that we have. They bring those elements to the table to us in a very thoughtful and also solution-oriented way. And I think that's probably one of the most important pieces in navigating this time. Um, also, I think agents need to be in a position to ask carriers for the tools that they need to properly explain to customers premium differentials, underwriting changes, and give them aspects of the business uh, that are valuable, excuse me, collateral that they can use that's valuable yeah. to really help reinforce that with their customers. Um, I just noticed that the big eye put out a piece recently, I, I, ABA. It's actually a toolkit that agents can use for really navigating this piece. A lot of, I'm going to say, tips and tricks, but quite frankly, they're very elegant and very practical to retain their customers. So that kind of collateral that's in the marketplace and also asking companies to provide that, I think is essential to maintaining that relationship in this difficult time. And you make a really good point there, Jeff. And as, I, as I'm listening to you talk about, you know, getting the tools, asking for the tools, I think about some of the things even, even SIAA has done uh, for its member agencies and even for agents at large relative to uh, panel discussions, which were inclusive of uh, carrier reps, um, talking about how do we come together to, to meet the challenges of this hard market, uh, how important, uh, to your point, communication is, how important the relationship is. Um, between all three players. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I think, evident to me that uh, there are tools that either are or can be made available. I see a willingness personally from the carrier side in terms of exchanging and, prov and provision of such tools, and that I think that it's incumbent upon the agent to also make sure that they're availing themselves of those same tools, that information, those resources. Yeah, Doug, I couldn't agree more. And I know this is to a, a broader audience than just the SIAA constituency, but obviously um, there are groups, and, and yours certainly include, that do an exemplary job of providing those particular pieces of collateral so those conversations can be more effective. But I'm, I'm going to bring it down to the, the core level again, and, and agents will tell me this all the time, right? They're, it's built into their natural paradigm. They're there to be a trusted advisor. They're there for the service they can provide to their customer. We can provide all the collateral in the world. In fact, I look at Competiscan, one of the sources we use to gather information, and there's tons and tons and tons of pieces out there that are saying to consumers, did you know that building costs are going up? Did you know vehicle costs are going up and vehicles are more complex? Did you know? Did you know? We're all saying about the same thing. Yeah. Until that agent, until that individual, that producer, that CSR, that person has that conversation where they do, in fact, personalize it to that customer and really talk about their exposure portfolio, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where people understand what's happening in the marketplace, where we're going, and why the relationship with the independent agent is so incredibly important in this dynamic. Yeah, uh, agreed. And, and as you say that, I'm also thinking that the ways that the, the agent can grease the wheels, so to speak, is to uh, to blog about some of these issues on their website or on social media or uh, different posts that they would make, their newsletters that they would send out to their clients. Um, it, you know, those are ways to grease the wheel before the one-to-one uh, -one 
communication is taking place. And to your point, there are tools available out there um, to to be utilized on the behalf of the agent to, to make that happen. And that's good stuff. And Doug, each agency has their own business model when it comes to retention activities. I mentioned the group I was with this week. I spent a lot of time asking them questions because I knew we were going to have this conversation. And you hear from some agencies, and again, uh, scale is a challenge, right? The larger you are, the more difficult it is to deploy some of these particular aspects of communication and contact. Yep. Some agencies have an annual review. So customers just know that conversation is going to occur, or at least the offer for it. Others said, and it was interesting, right? Unless the premium is going up X percent or $100 to $200, whatever that benchmark is, they won't have a conversation with their customer. Somewhere in the middle of all of those aspects is probably the, the right recipe for that, I'm going to use your words, right, to grease the wheels so when things happen, that line of communication is open and is the most effective at that point. Yeah, agreed. That's, and that's good insight. I want to step back then for a minute and get back to the, uh, the, the relationship uh, with the, between the carrier and the agent. And I guess I'm, I'm thinking about, and, and maybe, uh, maybe it's, uh, it, it's somewhat jaded in that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about SIA's experience here. But, but we have a lot of, uh, of members who join us who are startup agencies. And so I'm thinking to myself, for, for those uh, agents, and, and God bless them in, in, in starting up in the hard <laughs> yes, <market>. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about the initial steps that they can take uh, to establish that rapport with the carriers that they utilize. When you talk about brand new agencies, that really is an interesting piece to consider in this. Um, so I'll try to make my answer maybe combine brand new agencies, startups, and also perhaps more established agencies. Sure. Um, we do, and I think most companies do, have territory sales managers or um, or, or marketing reps or field reps or, or inside sales representatives on the phone. Creating that level of connection is really important. And I think it starts at the level, most companies and ours included, right? We'll reach out to new agencies. We'll have those conversations. We'll have very, very strong onboarding efforts, but they're essentially product specific, right? I'm thinking about Foremost. I'm thinking about Bristol West in the conversations we're having. Yep. But it is uh, also important that those agencies have the wherewithal to reach back out to their territory and sales managers and marketing reps to ask for more information, to get more detail, but then to also upstream them. I know through uh, your group, Doug, we've been asked several times to have group meetings or group sessions. Um, that's incredibly valuable. I mean, so I would say to, to from, for the smaller agency listening to this or the network or any other group, um, do have those conversations with your territory manager so they can upstream it to the next level of leadership. So if we need a group meeting to explain what's happening in the marketplace, we can put that in place. I think most organizations, certainly foremost included, are more than happy to put those in place because that one-to-many communication stream is incredibly effective for us, not only in terms of conveying information, but also getting back those harder questions. Um, and I would say – so to open my soapbox for a minute here, when we're doing these sort of one to 300, one to 400, very valuable, very interesting. But what we don't get a lot of times, Doug, are the underlying questions that people don't want to ask. Uh, when I talk to our teams, I think, Doug, just making sure you've heard of FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Yes. One of the things I talk to our teams about is FOLD, F-O-L-D, fear of looking dumb. We have this thing where we don't want to ask questions. We want to try to figure out on our, cell, on our own, yeah. can we get to the answer without much help? I really want to encourage agents, uh, when you're talking to your territory managers, when you're in these group sessions, don't worry about fold. Ask the question that's important to you because many times the question that you think exposes something you don't know is going to be incredibly valuable to everyone else in that audience and also to your fellow agents, especially ones that are in the new and startup mode. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's a that's that's such good insight, and it's it's really the truth, right? I I do I think that fold uh, comes into play way too often, uh, far too often, and uh, and yeah, especially in those group environments, there should be a, a little bit of strength in numbers in terms of, you know, hey, it's okay, somebody else has that same question, they're, and they're not asking it. So now, Doug, like a personal story on that, real quick, right? Yeah. I, 
I was working in um, one of our projects years ago, and uh, I call this having my head held underwater on IT because that wasn't my forte at the time. Yeah. And it was a whole new experience and the infrastructure and the joint architecture uh, meetings that were in place. And I'm in these meetings and they kept saying, well, we'll do that through KT. And I would write down accomplish through KT. And they said, KT is going to be the process for that. I went through about two weeks and I finally went to someone in IT and I went, I don't understand. How is KT going to solve all our problems? They went, oh, that stands for knowledge transfer. We'll just tell the other team what we're doing. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Two weeks of my life. <laughs> it's nice to know that another uh, specific uh, industry, IT, uh, has as many acronyms going around as the insurance industry. I'll tell you that. Uh, <laughs> so that that's a good story. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, though, as you were talking about uh, the territory managers, I'm trying to uh, – I'm. An honest assessment, Jeff, if I may, from your perspective of the responsiveness of the territory manager to the independent agent. So can you give me a little bit more detail around that one? I'm sure I can give you a response. When you think about responsiveness. Well, uh, by responsiveness, I mean, is is there – and I realize, obviously, that we're dealing with – uh, the 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 issue of numbers and just in terms of uh, how many okay. agents there are out there. But what I, what I'm getting at is that okay, I have a startup agency reaches out to a territory manager, and I have an established agency that reaches out to a territory manager. Obviously, there's only so much time in the day. There's going to be some prioritization going on. I mean, once in a while, I'll get that kind of feedback or those kinds of things will sure. come back to me that I you know I can't get can't get a hold of him or her. Okay. So I'll give you a bit of insight on that, I think, uh, vis-a-vis our team, and I don't know yeah. that it applies universally. Okay. Um, one of the things I think about that effective territory managers do, and I'm a bit biased there because I, I've been with Foremost for over 40 years. In fact, I'm, I, I'm so old that I wasn't called a territory manager when I started. I think it was called a special agent. But when I visited with my uh, – the non-new agencies, right, more tenured groups – I would say, what's your expectation on my contact level? How often should I be in contact with your agency? And I think really good territory managers ask that of their agencies, because quite frankly, I think there are a lot of salespeople that wander around pre-COVID, right? And maybe a little bit post-COVID, drinking your coffee and wearing out your sofa and bringing in donuts. Uh Not the job, not the job. The job is to advance the agency's business forward. So if territory managers and agents are doing a good job of communicating about what that level of contact should be, that then creates the space for new agencies to be able to reach out. I would also say that, and again, exposing my bias here, um, one of the things that we have at Foremost is we have an inside sales staff and we have field sales staff. Field sales staff can only get around to people when they can get around to people, right? Yeah. But inside sales can easily triage that call and good relationships between field representatives and inside sales representatives. And in our business, they are on equal footing. That ability to navigate that back and forth and triage that request is what creates the efficacy of contact. Along with that, Doug, guess what? Um, Thanks, COVID. We now have uh, a lot more ways to contact people. (laughs) I hate to say, unless I'm Amazon or Netflix, I hate to say thanks, COVID, but we do have a lot more ways to contact people. We have learned um, more ways to do business now than we ever have before. So that opens up the the complete toolbox. Um, The other thing I would say um, um, for groups, and again, I think I'm, I'm exposing my own personal opinion here. One of the things I've seen our claims organization do that I think larger agency groups could do as well is create informal connections between new individuals that are new to the enterprise. I'll give you an example for claims. Yeah. When we have our claims people out in the field when they're brand new, when we finally set them forth and they go out there, they come back in at an interval of, I think it's 90 days. And we get them together, not just with their supervisors, but with each other. And we observe their questions and their interactions. The stuff that they're able to provide to each other that are tips and tricks and great ways of doing business and also to expose the most important questions really creates value for us as a company. And I think if organizations that have more new agents built that kind of mechanism, they could upstream really valuable information to companies that we could act on. You know, that is so that is so good. I mean, you're providing I I love this. You're providing some insight for agents to see that, you know, there are there are things happening that they're probably not in tune to that the that the companies such as foremost are are involved in 
in order to better serve the needs of the agent. And I, and I don't think the agents necessarily think about that very much because on any given day, obviously the stresses of life and business, et cetera, come into play. But, but it is refreshing to hear that uh, foremost anyways, and hopefully others uh, are, are, are uh, implementing these kinds of processes in order to understand what the challenges are in the relationship overall. Yeah, again, that's incredibly important that we get that information upstream to us. And I think I'm probably speaking for more carriers than foremost. It's really easy for an agent to pick up the phone and call somebody and tell you all of the things that are not going right for them because of you. When they do it in a solution-oriented manner or when they aggregate that content, uh, and, and we get aggregated contents from state associations, we get aggregated to contents from a master agents in your group uh, or from regional um, presidents in other groups. Yeah. That is uniquely valuable to us because we can act on a, on a macro scale and grit, create the greatest amount of e efficacy for the largest population of any individual group. Yep. And that's all, and it's perfectly logical to take that approach, obviously. So I, I get it. And that's great. Now that kind of leads me to my next question then, um, which is, what are the qualities that a carrier or a representative, a field representative or a territory manager values most in an independent agent? Yeah, in some ways, this is going to feel like asked and answer, but I'll, I'll try yes, to not right. recap it too much. Yep. Um, really thoughtful, transparent, transparent communication. Yep. It is real easy to pick off the things that are not going well for a company. Uh, in fact, you know, we, we have been through some challenges in the past as an organization vis-a-vis -vis acquisitions, and it, it's really easy to pick those things out. It, it really is. But when agents can come to the table, and I had, again, I keep going back the last two days, it's very fresh in my mind, yeah. where an agent pulled me aside and sat down and said, you're doing this, and I get it, but what if you did it this way? I mean, it was incredibly eye-opening because they were trying to solve for us with us. Yes. And that was just, I mean... It, I look, I've been at this a long time, but every time it happens, I shouldn't be amazed, but I am. And I'm also rewarded by it because yeah. that um, that connection is incredibly, incredibly important. So when agents are thinking about business that way and giving us really insightful ideation um, along with that, and, and maybe I'm going too far in the same question, I think one of the things that impresses me so much about the independent AC channel after all these years is the consideration of mutual profitability. The things that an independent agent will ask to do to ensure that mutual profitability and the ways that they can help the company by asking those questions, getting that detail and then acting on it. That's so unique in our business channel, in the independent agency channel that does not exist elsewhere. And it's essential to the continued success of the channel. And it's one of the reasons why we continue to gain share over other channels. Yeah, that's well put. And that's a good insight. Uh, and you're right. It, it is fairly unique, isn't it? It, it most certainly is. And uh, I'll tell you, it is when it occurs, it, it is lightning bolt valuable for the business to get that kind of insight from independent agents, especially when it's solution oriented. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. Good, good insight. So I, I that leads, you know, there's a build here, and and you're probably already headed down this path. But I'm thinking about what you've just said and how that kind of facilitates the ongoing relationship. But are there other consistent actions or behaviors that uh, an agent can engage in that will, you know, be uh, complementary or will be enhance that that trust that relationship with the carrier? I do think. I mean, go ahead, Doug. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say. I mean, I mean, you, you've you've talked about how you know uh, how you approach that situation and that kind of communication is critical. And I'm just thinking about the ongoing maintenance of that relationship. Sure. One of the things I think about there is um, agents that are truly interested in the. I'm going to say that the financial health of the carrier and the carrier's ability to sustain their value proposition are the ones I think that maintain the best relationships. Um, I, I, I think about a conversation recently, not over the last two days, but maybe a, a few weeks ago where somebody said, tell me how things are going. Just tell me how things are going with the company. And then they said, tell me how we fit into that picture. They wanna write themselves into the story of the value proposition and the growth and profit plans of the organization. Yeah. That is such a rewarding aspect to hear. 
um, because they're 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 concerned in the long term viability of the organization because it impacts the long term viability of their their agency. They're not just thinking about how they can swap out carriers and move business around to ensure that the revenue stays uh, on a consistent level. They're thinking about ways that they can continue to perpetuate the growth of that carrier and their agency by working hand in hand on moving that process forward. So that's one. Another one I might add, and maybe I'm going down the wrong trail, mm -hmm. is to ask for interaction with leadership when appropriate. Um, I think most companies, but I can certainly speak for foremost, when you need to get to the next level, um, you'll get to the next level. <laughs> you will. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll have a conversation with somebody who knows maybe a bit more than a territory manager that can provide a bit more insight or listen to things in a slightly different way. So I would say, you know, when it's necessary to upstream to get the next person involved, absolutely do that. Reach out for it because I think your territory managers, your salespeople will also value that interaction as well because we do, quite frankly, all work as a team yeah. to ensure the success of the independent agents. Yes. Yes. Excellent. So it's funny because as you were talking, I'm thinking to myself, okay, you've answered my next couple of questions, um, which oh, sorry, <laughs> no, this is good. This is good it, it, uh, because I was, I was going to talk about or ask you about how do agents make sure they're seen as valuable partners. You've, you've answered that. Um, how do they get uh, constructive feedback from carriers? You've answered that. And then the next thing, I guess, the next question I have that I want to uh, touch base on is you had you had talked back a, a, a few moments ago about how um, um, the agent or the or the even the territory manager should ask the question, how often do you want me to be in touch with you? Let's swap that. How often should agents want to have that contact from your perspective? I mean, wow. <laughs> I'm going to give you the world's vaguest answer on that. And it's, it's the best I can offer. A number of years ago, someone said to me, and uh, they were a member of the National Association. Um, they just said out loud, you know how many types of independent agents there are? And I went, no, how many? And they said, as many types of independent agents as there are. <laughs> and it is, in fact, that incredible mosaic that makes our industry so powerful. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it makes it sort of challenging. I think that agents need to understand, uh, take back the word need. It's important that agents understand where the company, where the carrier is positioned within their office. So are they an accommodation carrier? Are they a core carrier? Are they a, uh, I'll need you when I'll need you carrier. Hmm. And that I think creates the level of interaction that agents should ask for. So if I'm, if I'm 40, 50% of your shop, obviously uh, that connection should occur Certainly, certainly, if when things are going well on a monthly basis. Yeah. And again, it depends on the size of your portfolio. If Foremost is a bit unique, uh, we have more than 33,000 um, producers, that, excuse me, agencies that represent us on a, a legal business entity basis. So we have to think about how we utilize our resources. But we have a wide variety of agents who have raised their hand and said, email. When something happens, just email me. Right. And then we have another group of agents that says, hey, Quite frankly, the way things are going, I need to see you every two weeks. And another group of agents says monthly is fine. Then we have another group of agents that really is focused on profit sharing. And they said, drop by every quarter when the loss ratio changes and tell me how we're doing. Gotcha. So again, good sales representatives create that conversation because it is need satisfaction selling. And part of that need is what need do you have for information? What need do you have for me? How can I as a sales representative, and it should be the goal of every sales representative, to lend value to that agency and to that relationship? Very good. That, that's actually, I, I like what you've just said, because um, frankly, it, it acknowledges that not one size fits all. And it also acknowledges that there's a very logical way to approach this. And, it, and it's kind of common sense when you talk about, hey, if you had a little grid and you're thinking about, you know, which carriers are providing how much of your business, um, that should help guide your thought process about how frequently you should be in touch. And you took it a step further and said, and market conditions also come into play. Right. So it, it may be a case of in a different market, you would at, you would look for that contact once a month or maybe just via email. But in a hard market like we're dealing with now, it may require more frequent contact. It, it may require more frequent contact or it may actually require sometimes more hands off. An agency might say during this time. I'm reading, uh, rereading actually uh, um, an old HBR book, Playing to Win. And, they, and P G talks about the focus on the customer. Like who is your customer and what level of focus will you have to ensure you'll have the best relationship with that customer? Agencies may say to us at this time, we'll see you in two months because right now it's all hands on deck with retention. We are making 60 calls a week to talk to our customers to ensure that they're going to stay with us. 
So we have to balance that as well. And again, I, I, that expression of um, wearing out your sofa and drinking your coffee, <laughs> look, I, I did the work. I could tell when I walked into an agency and they didn't want to see me. And so that's how I established the practice years ago of saying, how often should we be talking? Gotcha. So, so it's interesting, and and I, I can't believe we're actually running out of time here. But um, great conversation, by the way. I'm I'm thinking about what you just said about current market, all hands on deck. Should agents and and I think uh, carriers and companies already are uh, be thinking about nurturing the long term relationships beyond the scope of today's environment. And I, and, and I realize that there are a lot of folks in this industry right now who, you know, are looking at this and going, I, nothing else matters. I got to get through this. This is, this is unprecedented. But the reality is that you, you always, you need to look forward as well. Thoughts in your, from your perspective uh, about, you know, what agents should be thinking about beyond the hard market in terms of the relationship with their carriers. When I think about that beyond the hard market, and by the way, um, I think you've heard so many industry speakers this year say, and I'll add my voice to it, I I've never seen a year like this yeah. ever. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this. And and I'm not only the hard market that we're talking about, but as a carrier, I look at this and go, my gosh, which catastrophe is happening next <laughs> from a weather standpoint? What, what, what can I look forward to? I'm watching the tropical storms coming through. You, you need to have a long view in this industry because we've been successful over the long term. I can't think how many years ago it was that uh, one of the major consulting firms came out and announced the death of the independent agency system. Well, guess what? Uh, that didn't happen, pal. And, uh, and, and this too shall pass. Yeah. Uh, this difficult challenge we're having will pass. So I would ask agents, and this is my own bias again, to advocate for innovation on the part of the company and also to challenge their own paradigms as they go through this hard market. Um, I do see some agencies deploying uh, company-facing APIs on their website to allow for consumer quoting and sometimes booking. I think agencies should consider new ways of doing business that keep in touch with the way that the buying and servicing population is moving. Can agencies focus more on uh, bringing and onboarding new customers and maybe consider other ways to handle servicing so that the revenue light stays on while the retention light is strong in the background through servicing. So I think uh, establishing a bit more innovation and a bit more um, advocacy around automation in the agency is probably going to be the next step that helps agents be successful for the long term. That's that's so well put. And in fact, you've just given me a, a new catchphrase. I'm, I am going to use advocate for innovation going forward. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, let's face it. To, to your point, uh, you know, you, you can't always predict what the next year is going to uh, going to bring. And therefore, uh, innovation, if you innovate that, obviously, you're able to deal with something new and different because you're introducing something new and different. So, um, yeah, it's great advice and, and, and appreciate it. So we actually have run out of time, Jeff, uh, but I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. I know you've got, you've got a lot going on. Um, and, and seriously, uh, it's been great to spend 30 plus minutes with you uh, talking about this whole uh, issue of uh, making sure we maintain carrier connections. I want to thank you again. Well, Doug, thank you very much. It's obviously a privilege to be asked, and it's a privilege to speak in front of your audience. So thank you again so much. Sure enough. I, I just want to remind everyone that uh, our guest today has been Jeff Baer of uh, Foremost Insurance. He is the head of IA Marketing and National Accounts. And I also want to thank everyone for tuning in to Insurance Agents Talk Shop. I am Doug Coombs, Chief Marketing Officer at SIAA. To learn more about SIAA, the Agent Alliance, uh, the largest alliance of independent insurance agencies in the U.S., please visit SIAA.com. Jeff, thanks again, and everyone take care.